I was eight years old in 1983, full of hope and promise. I believed then that cool could banish lame. I believed that radness would always triumph over posers, and I sincerely hoped that Darth Vader would open up a chain of restaurants selling fresh Ewok burgers. <laughs> my grandparents had taken my sister and I in just before my sixth birthday, driving out to California in their big brown Cadillac to rescue us from our terrible, irresponsible, and thankfully divorced parents. I moved from the bustle of downtown San Jose to an old decrepit farmhouse in Indiana. It was boring as all shit, but it was also peaceful. There was no sign of my coked out programmer slash biker dad who hid his rent money in my piggy bank and had weird parties with naked people passed out everywhere. Or my stoner mom who had blown all her divorce settlement in Hawaii in one year and was now working as a waitress in San Jose. I had gone from being the focus of attention and their hatred of each other to just some kid in Asheville nowhere town. My dad had gotten custody of, of me, my mother had custody of my sister, and I visited my mother twice a month for weekends. Generally, I came away from either of them <clears throat> loaded with poison to tell the other, and they both spent all their time spoiling me. Here I was, two years later, in the middle of a cornfield in Madison, Indiana. We lived in a ramshackle old farmhouse, and no one paid attention to me that much anymore. No other kids lived within 20 miles of our house, so I only saw kids my age once a week at Boy Scouts. My grandparents were too old to do anything with me other than give me chores, and my sister had just grown boobs, so there was no one around most of the time. <laughs> I spent a lot of time completely unsupervised. All during that idyllic summer, the war simmered, full of shifting alliances and territories. It was Skeletor versus He-Man. Historians who have studied my bedroom extensively have come to call this the Dominion War of 1983. It became paramount to my eight-year-old self that He-Man would never triumph over Skeletor. Sure, in the cartoons and all that, I suppose He-Man was the good guy, but seriously, any skinny, nerdy little kid could never root for that big, blonde, idiotic frat boy. <laughs> the struggles between these titans were epic up in my drafty little second-floor bedroom. Hot Wheels, Barbies, G.I. Joes, Star Wars figures, they all joined in the violent free-for-all that my fleshless hero Skeletor would finally ascend to the throne of Grayskull. <laughs> the ongoing escalation of this conflict spilled into the yard about halfway through the summer when Skeletor married Lady J, cementing his alliance with the smaller but better armed G.I. Joe toys. It is said this was a loveless marriage, a union only for political reasons. <laughs> Perhaps if the Transformers had been there, they were not released until 1984, they could have had a role in preventing the escalation of hostilities. As it was, only Malibu Barbie remained neutral, and she was too busy war profiteering off of both sides to seek any reduction in the escalating conflict. <laughs> After the brief ceremony, the newlyweds, newlyweds lured He-Man out into the top of a small anthill in our huge side yard. All unsuspecting, He-Man went to the anthill, perhaps expecting to recruit the insects to his cause. But Skeletor had mined the anthill with several fireworks, their fuses tied together. After a few seconds with the lighter, I ran, and the explosion knocked He-Man over as the anthill exploded. The blast threw dirt and ants far up into the air. Skeletor and Lady J's wedding gift to each other had come off flawlessly, <laughs> causing the worst thing that could happen to any blonde, muscle-bound Nimrod. He was dirty and humiliated. <laughs> Historians of the Dominion War of 1983 point to this as the moment when the two sides moved beyond ideas of a stately gentleman's war. They had just been sort of hitting each other with their fists and all manner of plastic weapons, or making pew pew sounds with their plastic rifles. Now they had graduated to higher forms of warfare. The Skeletors dropped into the pool from a nearby tree, and being able to swim was trapped on the bottom until I suited up and rescued him. He-Man was buried up to his neck in the dirt, the summer sun beating down on his stupid smiling face while worms burrowed all around him. For a short time, a ceasefire came about, which I personally brokered before I went off to Boy Scout camp. Camp in the Midwest is miserable, hot, and you have to shit in hideously humid and stinking outhouses. I earned all manner of badges, but to this day I think they should have a merit badge for somehow unseeing other boys' balls when they poke out the bottom of their little uniform shorts. <laughs> and maybe one for not vomiting every time you smell the outhouses. Perhaps because I returned from that camp hot, miserable, and full of shit, I had held it the last two days. The outhouses were just too gross. 
The final do- days of the war played out the next time I was alone at the house. My grandparents had gone out, probably to get McDonald's coffee with all the other old people. And my sister was at her friend Bliss's house, trying on bras or something. <laughs> Home alone, I was party to Skeletor's master plan. He would burn He-Man, scorch his skin from his ridiculous beefcake body, shrivel and blacken his Nordic perfection. He-Man would become this hideous, charred monster, dead and yet alive. Another minion of Skeletor, and finally there would be peace in my bedroom. In support of this masterstroke, I took an old red plastic frisbee, turned it upside down, and filled it with rubbing alcohol on my bedroom floor. Skeletor and I then lured He-Man to the center of it with tales of a new workout routine done while ankle-deep in alcohol. Of course, the lumbering idiot fell for it. To this day, I have no good reason as to why I did not do this whole thing outside. Or at least clear everything flammable from around the frisbee. Perhaps, perhaps it was the influence of Skeletor who just wanted to watch the world burn. I lit the shallow bowl, and then I realized I had forgotten something. Water to put out the fire if it spread. Me, a Boy Scout. This was contrary to all fire safety rules. I rolled my eyes at my own stupidity, and I walked calmly down the hall and got a glass of water. I realized my mistake in trusting Skeletor as I returned to my room. The old low-hanging curtains had caught fire when I left, and the flames were licking up them eagerly. Stared for a second, perhaps indulging the little pyromaniac who lives in every dumb little boy, before springing into action and throwing the cup of water on them. Hi-ya! Which, of course, did almost nothing. Panic bloomed in my mind as I realized this was how houses burned down to the ground. Most importantly, as I realized how much trouble I was going to get into. When the wallpaper on the ceiling blackened, I nearly lost it. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, was my mantra imitating my foul-mouthed, face-farting sister. And in sudden inspiration, I recalled my training. After all, I had been in the shit, as we say, in Boy Scout camp only the week before. Looking around, I quickly snatched up my trusty Smurf sleeping bag. Wrapping my hand in the jaunty fabric, I yanked the curtains down and smothered them in my loyal Smurfs. I almost kicked over the frisbee full of rubbing alcohol, and then screamed as I pictured my whole body being engulfed in flames. The already hot summer day now felt like it had climbed to inferno temperatures with the fire in the room. I blew out the rubbing alcohol, which was still burning, and dumped it out in the bathtub down the hall. Rushing back to my room, I saw what a mess it was. The window was scorched and blackened, and the smoke was hanging heavy in the air. Coughing, I opened the windows. I set about using my now ruined Smurf sleeping bag to douse anything still smoking and pour some water on anything that felt hot. This was made difficult by traumatic flashbacks to scout camp, of smothering campfires with ashes and dirt, and the whimsical, folksy aroma of shit in the outhouses. (laughs) Skeletor gloated from where I had kicked him across the room in my struggle. He-Man had been reduced to a smoking, pitiful thing. He-Man had, in fact, half-melted into the carpet. Snake Eyes, Boba Fett, and Darth Vader looked on in horror at what this war had wrought. For half an hour or so I worked, making sure the fire would not reignite. Thinking I would somehow get away with it, I got a trash bag and threw the Smurf sleeping bag into it, along with the ruined curtains and a few clothing items that had been laying around. It was then I realized how Skeletor had used me in his nihilistic plot to destroy the entire universe (laughs) of my room. While washing my hands, I wiped the soot off my face, and just then my Uncle David and my face-farting sister pulled up. Kelly, my older sister, who I'd like to point out once more, had literally farted in my face several times, said David wanted to take us down to get a soda at Roger's drugstore and then read comic books. So I hopped in the back of his old car. Still thinking I might get away with it, I leaned forward when my uncle started talking about getting an Irish setter. I love dogs. And put my arms up on the back of the bench seat in front of me. My sister glanced over from the passenger seat and her eyes widened comically. Oh my God, Grody, what is wrong with your arm? I glanced down curiously. On my forearm was a big bubble of flesh, half full of some liquid, maybe two inches across, huge on my skinny little arms. An interesting fact, some third-degree burns cause no pain because the nerve endings are literally destroyed. 
as I had valiantly battled the fire that I had caused, I laid my arm on the burning curtains I was smothering. Though I still felt nothing, it looked disgusting. A thin bubble of flesh stressed over raw, exposed muscle and some foul alien liquid sloshing in the blister of flesh. <laughs> in typical kid fashion, I broke down into tears and confessed everything. My alliance with Skeletor, planning explosives, <laughs> tossing Skeletor from the tree into the pool, the arms dealing of Malibu Barbie, <laughs> Boba Fett selling his services to both sides, and the use of Hot Wheels for the war supply chain. Oh, and of course, setting my room on fire. <laughs> my Uncle David, looking confused, turned around at the next driveway and we went home. He looked in my room. <whistles> I, still crying, realized I would never have been able to hide this. Burned throw carpet, soot marked hardwood floor, blackened window frame, the wallpaper around the window bubbled and destroyed, and the ruined half circle of ceiling over the window. It was then I realized what a dumb little kid I was. The boredom of a friendless summer and my progressive yearning for attention of any kind was not even an excuse. I had never been more scared in my life than thinking of what my grandparents would do, probably send me back to either my idiot dad or my stone mother. When grandma and grandpa got home though, they just, well, they just sort of took it in stride. Grandma fussed over my arm, called up a doctor to find out what to do with it. Grandpa made up a, a bed on the couch for me since my room smelled so bad, and he said he would clean it all, all up tomorrow and then he did. They loved me, even though I was a stupid, careless kid who almost burnt their house down. They waited until I calmed down, and after I had sort of explained what had happened, they told me not to play with fire, firecrackers, or any of that anymore. Grandma explained to me in simple, clear words that I knew better, and I realized I really did. Skeletor and I, well, we never again allied ourselves. <laughs> Surprisingly, Grandma and Grandpa let him stay at the house, too, in spite of the events of the Dominion War. Maybe they loved him, too. They did throw He-Man out, though. Maybe because he was burned, but I think they just knew how utterly lame he was. <laughs> it took years for my arm to scar over. To this day, I still have a nickel-sized war wound. The scar got smaller as I grew older. Give it up for Vamp first-timer Jacob Wilson! <laughs> 